Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Roadmap Initiative, Natural History 101, Power of the Patient Experience, the Basics of Natural History Registries. My name is Mary Vias, and I'm the president of PSC Partners Canada. I'm joining this webinar today from Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. So um, let's get started. This webinar will begin with a presentation by three speakers, followed by moderated breakout rooms for Q&A and discussion. Our speakers are Dr. Gideon Hirschfield, Dr. Cara Mack, Dr. Bettina Hansen. We appreciate you all so much for being here. And an extra shout out to Dr. Hansen, who's joining us from the middle of the night in Europe. Next slide, please. This meeting is the ninth in our series of 10 roadmap webinars. Hopefully by now, you've seen this roadmap graphic. To the right are three of the main stakeholders, patients, researchers, and clinicians. On the left are the four topic areas that the roadmap initiative is covering, shown as steps. We are currently on topic four, natural history, which means we're approaching the uh, June annual conference. Next slide, please. And before we jump in, um, I'd like to review the goals of Roadmap, which are accelerating progress to find therapies and a cure by one, educating the patient community on the research landscape, two, broadening the researcher base and strengthening multi-stakeholder communication, and three, creating opportunities for researchers and clinicians to engage in meaningful discussions with an informed patient community. Next slide, please. Thank you again for joining us and welcome. I will pass on the Zoom mic to Ricky Safer, founder and CEO of PSC Partners Seeking a Cure. Thank you, Mary, and hello, everybody. Thank you tonight's attendees, both first timers and repeat attendees. Tonight, we are excited to introduce the basic terminology and concepts related to natural history registries to set the stage for next month's webinar, when we will introduce plans for PSC Partners' own natural history study. Natural history studies are a great way to use the power of the patient experience to drive research and drug development. And all patients play a central role in these uh, natural history studies. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Alvareo, Intercept, Eshant, Mira, Miram, and Sima Bay for their support of our ongoing roadmap initiative. We will start off with three expert speakers. Dr. As uh, Mary said, Dr. Gideon Hirschfield will review the basics of natural history studies, followed by Dr. Kara Mack, who will discuss the power of natural history registries to drive research forward and the importance of patient involvement. Dr. Bettina Hansen will draw connections between natural history and drug development. Now, I'm pleased to briefly introduce tonight's expert speakers. Dr. Gideon Hirschfield, holds the inaugural Lily and Terry Horner Chair in Autoimmune Liver Disease at the University of Toronto and is a professor of medicine. As a clinician scientist, Dr. Hirschfield manages translational and trials-based clinical science with the goal of advancing therapies for patients with inflammatory liver disease, including PSC, that prevent the need for transplantation. Dr. Kara Mack is a professor of pediatrics and division chief of pediatric gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition at Children's Wisconsin Medical College of Wisconsin, specializing in the care of children with immune-mediated liver diseases, including PSC. Her research interest is in autoimmune liver diseases, and she is the chair of the Childhood Liver Disease Research Network's Pediatric PSC Observational Study and treatment trial. Dr. Bettina Hansen is a biostatistician at Toronto Center for Liver Disease, Toronto General Hospital, and principal investigator and founder of multiple real world databases for rare diseases. The Global PS PBC Study Group, CANAL, NAPT, GALA for Rare Outcome, RETRACT for Hepatitis B, and Escalon for river ca Liver Cancer. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Hirschfield. That's great. Thank you very much um, for the introduction and thank you very much for um, hosting this um, webinar. 
uh, and asking uh, myself and colleagues to speak. So really, I've got a very easy job. Um, I'm going to speak for the next five, 10 minutes and just give you a very high view on natural history cohort studies and just give you some concepts and thoughts to anchor what you'll then hear from my colleagues, Dr. Mack and, and Dr. Hansen, um, and to help you understand why patient participation is so powerful, particularly um, in rare diseases and particularly in PSC. Next slide. So, you know, what we are all doing when we do clinical research is research for patient benefit. We are attempting to use the information that you tell us in clinic to help develop better understanding of your disease and ultimately to help develop new drugs. So this is in parallel to taking your samples and doing clever science, is actually integrating the information that we learn simply from listening to you in clinic um, and what happens to you. It's important because the better we do that, the better we understand the disease, the better able we are to identify who needs new treatments and when to give them. Okay, uh, next slide. We understand that when you are diagnosed with PSC, the journey that you're about to face is stressful, especially at the start, because the first question you ask and those who want to develop new drugs and help the development of new drugs is what is going to happen to me and how certain are you when it's going to happen to me and can you predict if it's going to happen to me or somebody else? So journeys are stressful, especially at the start. Okay, next slide. So at that point, I don't know whether your journey with your PSC is going to be a very simple journey or a very bumpy journey and a bumpy journey with obstacles. But from the point of diagnosis, to your destination is your untreated natural history. So the term natural history is normally used to understand what happens to a disease without effective intervention. So largely, it is true to say in PSC, where we don't have good treatments, we are studying your untreated natural history. If we learn about what happens to you and as many other patients with PSC, from the minute you get your diagnosis, along the journey, which may have winding pathways, may have bumps, may have obstacles, and we can learn um, that natural history. And we want to use that natural history, what happens to you because of the disease, to help you get new treatments. Next slide. So, you know, what we are trying to do is collect as much information because our patients are very different and a disease like primary sclerosis and cholangitis is what's known as very heterogeneous. So we need as many patients to contribute their natural history, which is just their narrative with what happens to them and when it happens to them, so that we can follow what happens to you from the point of diagnosis and strictly in the context of PSC, really understand the untreated progress of your disease, but factor in some interventions and say, did those interventions help? And because we do those studies, and because those studies are getting better, with better patient participation, and are larger, more thorough, with better statistical support from people such as Dr. Hansen, we are better able to answer questions for you, but any questions that you ask are the same questions that drug discoverers asked and the same questions that um, organizations that license drugs ask. What is your prognosis? When uh, will you develop symptoms? Will I need a transplant? How old will I be when my liver needs replacing? Am I at risk of cancer? Will I develop another autoimmune disease? Can you predict if I'm going to run into problems in the next five years? So that is the power of learning about natural history in the broadest sense and why it's so important. And in fact, why we've got better and better at it and why you're going to listen to my colleagues, Dr. Mack and Dr. Hansen, give you examples 
of how we've made progress. Next slide. The treated natural history is slightly more complicated and is somewhere in the middle for primary sclerosis and cholangitis because we do give our patients some treatments, we do do certain interventions, and we don't always know whether they've helped. And fundamentally, where we want to get to is a new treatment, which we develop as quickly as possible and show to you and to the people that pay for the drugs and the people that license the drugs that that treatment changed your natural history. It did something positive, we hope, without safety effects. So questions that we are already answering from natural history studies, um, where it's a sort of combination of natural history and treated history is, does ursa deoxycholic help my liver disease? What a controversial question. I had an ERCP, has that slowed down my liver disease progression? What do my liver tests predict? So we do your blood tests all the time. Are they telling us something more than what's happening on the day? Are, are they predictive of events? Are they predictive of treatment response? You have a colonoscopy every year if you've got inflammatory bowel disease. Does the annual colonoscopy really help? Well, we can tell you by looking at big natural history studies. How will I do after a liver transplant? How long am I going to live? Is the disease gonna come back? How do you know it's a success? Okay. What happens if I treat my colitis to my liver disease? Will it make it better? Will it make it worse? So this is where we use the treated natural history to answer questions. And we hope that in the future, natural history studies will actually allow us to test whether new treatments are actually working and safe. Next slide. Well, you know, the next thing I was asked to cover is what is a registry and what is a study? Okay, so there are strict definitions. Um, I think the way I like to answer this question is what we are doing with a registry, a collection of data that we store on as many people as possible is getting real world data. What is really happening to patients in different parts of North America, Europe, the rest of the world. We are getting information about you, about your disease, about your treatment, that may include endoscopies, about what happens to you in clinic, in the hospital operating room, in the endoscopy suite, at home, about how you feel, about people in your family with similar diseases, about the good things that happen to you and the challenges that you face. And I see a registry as this collection of patient information that we're storing essentially in the cloud anonymously without reference to exactly who you are on as many people as possible. And then a study is what we do with that data. And that study can have a big goal. We'd like to know everything about PSC, but also over time, this registry can have sub studies with very specific questions where we can ask a very specific question of our registry data. Did giving you ursa deoxycholic acid make a difference to what happened to you? And we have a thousand patients who got ursa deoxycholic acid in the real world and 2000 patients who didn't. And we will look at the two groups and compare. And we can do that multiple times. And we build, the better the registry we build, the more opportunities we can expand the study questions over time. Next slide. How do you find and join a, a registry? Fundamentally, you ask. It doesn't matter whether you go to a small center or a big center, you advocate for yourself and you ask, I have primary sclerosis and cholangitis. It is a rare disease. We don't know enough about this disease. How can I partake in research for patient benefit? How will you facilitate that for me? In reality, if you go to a center with an interest in research and teaching, then it is highly likely that the, the clinics will want to take part in research with patients and about PSC. PSC Partners is in fact a very good way to understand what natural history registries there are for PSC and for inflammatory bowel disease. But you can also ask Dr. Google, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and you can search for these things. But the most important thing is you have a voice and you use it. Next slide. 
What are your expectations on joining a study? Well, I mean, they may be very long and that's great, but I thought of five reasonable expectations for patients joining a natural history registry and study. One, there's a clear purpose. So the people that have organized it have got a overarching question which addresses an overarching hypothesis. Two, have certainty in how your data is stored and shared with privacy in mind. Now, this is where the institutional protections come in. We are very good at doing this. It does introduce significant obstacles for us. We are just mere small number of investigators in a big world of research. And so there is a significant amount of governance that is set up by people outside of the PSC world. And we follow it. And we try our very best to make sure that we don't make any mistakes and that your data is precious and looked after very carefully and anonymously. Have trust in the center and the collaborators to know how to analyze the data and present the data. That is why, for example, I enjoy working with Dr. Hansen, who is you know, a professor of biostatistics, because my mathematics skills are not good enough to use the data to the best ability. My skill comes in asking the question. That question is often framed from what I see in clinic and listening to the questions that you raise, either in clinic or through patient charities. But we need the people who really understand how to use big data to show that we're using it appropriately. Hope that collectively the information will progress the field, recognizing that if it was easy, we would have solved it already. But with an effort which is slow and persistent, we are going to make progress. And have an expectation because you live in the real world, because you understand there are many stakeholders to the success of this of any disease, but the success of PSC will not only come from your clinician and you as the patient, we will need people who are scientists, people who are statisticians, people who work for drug companies, people who know how to make drugs, people who know how to regulate drugs, people who know how to sell drugs, you know, people who know how to deliver drugs. And we need to know that we can use the data to help everybody, which means we will need to share with permissions and uh, checks and balances um, that your data will be used appropriately to benefit the most people. Realistically, it may not benefit you, but over time it will benefit more people than you imagine. Next slide. So it's all about how to refine the future. We don't know everything. We do, however, have confidence that if we build good natural history studies and that we build them to the right size with your help, that we can positively contribute to the future of new drug development for PSC. Uh, and I think uh, there's no more slides. And I'm now going to hand over to uh, um, Dr. Mack, who I'm sure will give you um, a great presentation on the power of natural history studies to drive research forward. Thank you. So I'm going to talk first about the importance of natural history studies and the benefits for research. As Gideon mentioned, the definition of a patient registry is a very organized system for collecting, storing, and disseminating information on people with a specific disease. And the PSC Partners Registry is an example of that. In contrast, a natural history study has very specific goals. It, want, it focuses on the disease presentation and the progression of disease. Natural history studies track a disease course over time in order to determine outcomes of that disease and risk factors associated with those outcomes. And sometimes data from registry studies can augment natural history studies and possibly eliminate the need for having to collect certain data points. Next slide. So who can join a natural history study? Most natural history studies do not have strict exclusion criteria compared to clinical treatment trials. Natural history studies aim to be very inclusive to accept most, if not all comers, and be diverse in order to capture an accurate representation of the disease. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So why do we need natural history studies? We need them in order to accurately track the course of disease over time. Natural history studies also identify variables that correlate with disease severity in the absence of treatment, as Gideon mentioned. And importantly, natural history studies inform drug development and assist in clinical trial design. Next slide. So shown here is the pathway to drug development. And what I want to point out is at the very bottom where it all starts is knowledge of a disease's natural history. It sets a stage for drug development. And uh, Dr. Hansen will be going over this in more detail, but this is an example of how important natural history studies are. Next slide. So why do natural history studies take so long? Well, it takes many years, sometimes even a decade, to accurately characterize the progression of a disease. Some people progress more quickly and some progress very slowly. In addition, it may take many years to observe a specific endpoint, such as the need for transplant or the development of cancer. And because it can take many years to really accurately characterize the natural history, it's very important for patient participants in this research to follow up uh, at the predetermined time. Most natural history studies want the participants to come back every year. And this is very important because if there is a lot of missing uh, time points where people don't show up for those follow-up visits, that is called missingness of data you don't have that particular data, say two, three, four years out, and too much missingness of data will lead to inaccurate results. Next slide. So there are many types of natural history study designs. There are medical literature reviews, retrospective chart reviews, and for retrospective chart reviews, that's where you uh, determine a list of questions that you want to answer, but then you go backwards in time to the time of diagnosis, and you have to go to the medical charts to find that, and then from that time of diagnosis, you have to uh, scan through the medical charts to find the data that you're interested in. Retrospective chart reviews often have a uh, a higher level of missingness of data because you're relying on the previous provider to document the data that you are interested in collecting. Another form of natural history design is a cross-sectional study where you pick a point in time during that disease process. For example, you want to look at 10 years after a diagnosis and clearly define where that patient population is at. That's a cross-sectional study. A prospective longitudinal study is where you capture the um, patient's disease at the time of diagnosis and follow it through for a predetermined number of years. And then a randomized controlled study is uh, usually more commonly seen in treatment trials. Next slide. So this is an example of a retrospective natural history study. And this was the uh, data from the International Pediatric PSC Consortium, which had close to 100 different sites worldwide collected information on over a thousand patients, but it was retrospective. You had to go back through charts to collect information. But based on the fact that it was over a thousand patients, some very powerful data came out of it. And this is just an example of that, that through that retrospective natural history study, we were able to determine that in the pediatric population, 10 years after diagnosis, 70% uh, 
were uh, surviving with their native liver, meaning they did not need transplant. Next slide. This same uh, international consortium also identified uh, another prognostic uh, marker. So in this study, they looked at GGT and if your and then we're able to identify the GGT one year after diagnosis. If your GGT one year after diagnosis was less than 50, that was a good prognosis. You didn't have any of the um, poor outcomes listed there on the left, such as portal hypertension or transplant. And if your GGT was high, greater than 50, um, you had a higher likelihood of having one of those poor outcomes. So this is just an example of the data that we can collect, even with a retrospective study uh, on the natural history of pediatric PSC. Next slide. This is an example of a prospective longitudinal natural history study that uh, someone just asked in the chat, what is GGT? Uh, a GGT is another marker of bile duct injury similar to alkaline phosphatase. In adults, alkaline phosphatase is routinely measured. In pediatrics, GGT is more common, but it, they both reflect bile duct injury. Um, okay, so this is an example of a prospective natural history study. So in this study, they took uh, adults with PSC, and at the time of enrollment, they asked them to get fiber scans. And for at least five years after, every single year, they obtained a fiber scan. And they, uh, shown on the right, are the different subpopulations of the whole PSC group. So each line in that graph is a patient population based on the severity of their liver fibrosis or scarring at the time of enrollment. So the lower lines are people with mild scarring at the time of enrollment, and the upper lines, those people had more scarring of the liver at the time of enrollment. But because they came back every year and had their fiber scans, they were able to accurately show the slope of the line or the rate of rise of the scarring of the liver tissue over time. So very powerful data was obtained regarding the progression of scarring from this natural history uh, design. Next slide. So I'm gonna finish by talking about a natural history study that the Childhood Liver Disease Research Network is doing. And shown here are all of the sites in the United States as well as Canada, Toronto, that are involved in the Children Network and in the PSC Natural History Study. Next slide. So in the Children PSC Study, we're actually using three different types of study design. Uh, a brief retrospective chart review, we'll be asking questions based on cross-sectional analysis, and then the study is mainly designed as a prospective longitudinal study. Next slide. In the uh, prospective observational study of PSC in children, we have four main aims, and this study just started in December of 2021, so we are actively enrolling with a goal of enrolling up to 750 patients over 10 years. The first aim is to characterize the phenotype or the clinical picture of that patient based on if they also have IBD, autoimmune hepatitis, or recurrent cholangitis, the bacterial cholangitis and the impact that that clinical phenotype or picture has on the eventual outcome, such as the progression of liver scarring. Aim two is to characterize the global functional health and really clearly define what is the impact 
on the quality of life of children with PSC. AIM-3 will be testing novel uh, imaging studies such as the fiber scan and other new imaging techniques to uh, more accurately predict the progression of the disease. And then AIM-4 is to create a repository of biospecimens for mechanistic studies. So this is your blood and your stool for future studies. Next slide. This is an example of all of the data that we're collecting in the PSC study. So at baseline, you can see there, we are looking backwards to collect some data. And in the bottom, all the colored uh, words are different things that we're collecting from labs all the way through fiber scan and biospecimen. So you can see a lot of natural history studies are very involved collecting a lot of information and matching that with the clinical outcomes. Next slide. I've just got a couple more slides. So this is an example from all this data, how we can do a cross-sectional analysis or a snapshot of what does it look like five years after the diagnosis of PSC. And we will be able to do that and clearly paint a picture of the various outcomes at five years. Next slide. Alternatively, after 10 years, we'll be able to tell you uh, what do the, for example, how do the patients progress with their PSC based on fiber scan results, which tell you the degree of scarring of that liver. So we'll be able to show the uh, rate of progression and factors that may impact that progression from this natural history study. Next slide. So in summary, natural history studies accurately can track disease over time in order to determine specific outcomes. It's essential for natural history studies to be successful that people follow up in order to prevent missingness of data. And one more powerful thing about natural history studies is we can match that clinical data and use biospecimens to discover new biomarkers that may predict uh, prognosis or response to drugs. And it's important to remember that in natural history studies, both the uh, participant and the researcher need to be patient because it takes many years to get results. Next slide. Thank you. And next, I would uh, like to introduce Dr. Bettina Hansen, uh, who's going to talk about drug development in natural history studies. Hi, thank you, Kara. Hope you all can hear me. Um, so, indeed, I need to tell you that um, I am not a clinician, uh, but a biostatistician. Next slide, please. So this is the, I just wanted to say that this is my disclosures to make sure that these, this is the thing that I'm working with daily. These are all kinds of formulas. Uh, so I'm not the specialist to ask about your disease, uh, but really it's about uh, calculations with using these databases that uh, we are trying to set up with regard to, uh, for example, PSC, but it can be any kind of diseases, uh, and especially rare diseases is one of the things that I'm working on. Originally from Denmark, I moved to the Netherlands and Canada, and uh, now I'm back in the Netherlands, and that's why you see this dark background here, uh, because it's the middle of the night here. Next slide, please. So again, I think Gideon and, and Kara very much already touched upon that, but for rare diseases and rare or distant outcomes, it's not only rare diseases, but also diseases with rare outcomes, it's important. When you look at a, a single center, it becomes very difficult to say a lot about the whole natural history or the, the day, how in, any patient will react because it's very centralized. Um, and the results across these sites uh, are very heterogeneous. You might have a site that is very good at, at a specific, specific technique or uh, experts uh, in a specific site. Next slide. 
So why it's important to make these collaboration across sites to make, better understand the natural history of a disease. Uh, and there is a strong need to collaborate across institutes, especially when you are dealing with rare diseases or rare outcomes and to exchange uh, expertise and new techniques. Next slide. I think the network that we do work on, on where we are doing real world data uh, on a big scale is more than just a cohort sharing data, but it's really also sharing expertise and techniques. Uh, so that's why I'm a part of it because I bring in my statistical knowledge and uh, Gideon and Kara bring in what they are daily seeing uh, and then we all get together to gain new knowledge about a disease and update guidelines. I'm going to touch upon the four, four or three things actually, search for biomarkers and source for trial design and use of synthetic controls and these are three things that I have been working specifically on uh, to develop more uh, proper statistics for these things. Um, it's not something that I'm doing alone, but it's doing, I'm doing this within this network and I'm talking on behalf of this network. But I also have uh, reached out to drug regulators uh, for FDA and EMA who are helping out thinking along uh, how to use the data the best way. Next slide. So I think it's important that we join forces uh, to come from a rare disease, for example, to have built up these gigantic databases and maybe even have multiple databases where we can look into specific uh, disease questions that we want to solve. Next slide. And um, FDA guidance, and that I think is important. They they have really seen uh, the importance of historical controls and it's also a requirement nowadays that you need to understand the disease before you can put up a good drug. It's, it's, it's used in all phases of drug development and the knowledge is important for planning to identify the patient population, so which one is in need of treatment, uh, which one is in urgent need of treatment, which, which one have a milder disease, for example, it's important to identify our development uh, of the clinical outcome. What is it that we really want to solve? Uh, is it the itch, for example, in some diseases that you want to solve? Is the quality of life you want to solve? Is it uh, prognosis in general? Um, important thing is also we look at the development of biomarkers to try to find these biomarkers in the haystack of all these blood measurements that are taken that can best describe the disease progression. And then we use these external control databases um, and historical data for the study design to make sure that we get it right uh, and understand also how, how big is the problem, how many patients have this specific need, uh, how many patients um, have a milder disease progression. And the thing that I've been working on lately is also to use these external controls in a specific circumstance as a control arm in studies. Next slide. There is a very big uh, additional benefit uh, directly for you as a patient, because you can indeed through this real world data that we're putting up, establish a communication pathway between the patients like we're doing tonight. And I think that's super valuable because that's teaching us uh, also me as a statistician, what you find is important because that is what we need to, to look at. This is, that is why we are here, uh, to really find out what is the need. Uh, we need to identify the C-specific centers of excellence. That is really true, but I think we need all sites actually, not only the excellent sites, um, but we need all the, all the patients from all sites in that sense and all the knowledge that we gain uh, and pull that out to try to understand and evaluate the current standard of care and the quality of life, for example. We want to improve the patient care and change the guidelines if needed. And from a really from, from a statistical um, point of view and epidemiologic point of view, you want to understand the disease demography 
estimate incidence and prevalence. That's a, these are kind of statistical numbers. You want to find out how many have got it in comparison to where you live. Uh, what are the disease characteristics that we are interested in? Outcomes, progression, high and low risk groups. So these are the things that you look at from a statistical point of view, but it's important to try to understand the disease. Next slide. So I'm going to take an example, and it's not from PSE, but from PBC. And it's about uh, new treatments that have uh, developed recently in 2016, which are fibrates and OCA. So there are new treatments for patients with PBC, mainly for patients with more advanced PBC, and who are really in need of a new kind of treatment to help them out. And it's a, it's a success story. But I think that it's important um, to show you how real-world data was actually used in this case. Next slide. So important when you're setting up a study, and that is what FDA really requires, is that we look at this true endpoint here, the, the blue one, that you, the blue dark blue one. Uh, and what is true endpoint? It's what a patient finds important. It has to be relevant for the patient. So that's the reason why we have to talk and keep communicating with each other. Uh, so they formulate it in this way. That's what the FDA does, for example. It measures directly how a patient feels, functions, or survives. So quality of life is definitely a part of a true endpoint. Next slide. But sometimes these endpoints are too far away, especially when we have distance rare diseases, or when the, the true endpoints are invasive, costly, or confounded by other diseases, for example, you, a patient could have more multiple diseases. So it's important sometimes to look in a shorter time frame, also because of time, you don't want to wait for 10 years to find out if it works or not. And that's the reason why we use what we call surrogate endpoints. And surrogate endpoints um, needs to capture the true endpoint, that's what it really is about. Next slide. So we capture the real world data that we have, for example, in, in the global PPC study group, which I uh, am part of, Gideon Hirschfeld is also part of this. Uh, we have more than 6,000 patients in this real world data bank, we could say. And also we have for each of the patients, their visits over time. So we have that from the moment that they were diagnosed. And for each visit, we carry uh, all the databases that were, all the patient points that were measured into this data point, uh, into this database, sorry. That's why there are 49, more than 49,000 patient visits. You can imagine you can swim in these databases. There are so many data points in here that you really need to be totally clear in your head when you try to analyze these things. And there are more than 20 years of follow-up for these patients, and that's a, a, just a gold mine when trying to understand, in this case, PBC. Next slide. So when we wanted to, to look at OCA or fibrates uh, and to see if these new potential drugs were working, uh, we studied to find a surrogate endpoint because we don't want to wait 15 years to find out whether they really work. Um, and we used the real world data of the global PBC study group to find the surrogate endpoints, which we, we only need one year of follow-up for. Next slide. And here to the what you see here to the right is one of the results that we found was indeed that alkaline phosphatase is a very good measurement on severity of the disease. And if you can get it low, uh, so if it's lower than uh, two times the upper limit of normal, that's a measurement that, that you have. That's the blue line here. You have a better prognosis than if your alkaline phosphatase gets higher. And that was the reason why uh, uh, actually that OCA was approved because you could show that OCA that really were treating these high risk patients lowered the alkaline phosphatase below two, actually below 1.67. And that is the reason why in 2016, we got new treatments 
for patients uh, who are at high risk and where UCA does not work, and OCA was approved um, conditionally. So what does the conditionally mean? Well, that means that it only lowers the ALP, but we actually still do not know if it improves survival. Uh, next slide, please. So the next thing that we then we're looking at now, and that's the thing that is ongoing right now, and it's uh, uh, <clears throat> hot from the press, was that we're trying to compare and use the real world data to compare with, with trial data. And there, of course, we have a mixed population. And we realize that, but there are ways and statistically where we can can align these things. Next slide. And I think it's important that all the stakeholders in this uh, are really trying to put this together. So it's not something that uh, uh, that I'm standing alone to do this. It is really a whole team behind this, also from pharma, from independent researchers and regulatories, and it's definitely patients. Next slide. So what we're trying to do, we know that we have this treated cohort with new drugs that have all been treated and they have a long follow-up. And we are now try, trying to compare it with real world data to see whether this treated cohort are doing better or worse than the patients that were not treated. Next slide. And this just is, is a very, maybe a little too sophisticated for now. But what we have here, when you look at the, on the right side of the slide, we have the treated cohort. And from the real world data, we now pull in a specific manner, data in such a way that we get a balanced cohort that we really can compare these two. Next slide. And this is the results that we with it, then were able to show using this global PPC study group databases and to compare whether OCA was a better drug for these patients than the patients who um, were treated without OCA. So this is the kind of work that I'm doing daily and we were able to conclude that there are, these are the first data showing improvement in the occurrence of clinically important outcomes with OCA. Next slide. So key, and this is my last slide, key takeaways, there's a benefit in using real world data and innovative methodology to study new interventions. Not only can we find surrogate endpoints, we can make better trial design and we can use these real world data as a, a sort of new controls in uh, to learn much faster. Um, I think uh, I will stop here and uh, give the word back to uh, Ruth Ann and I, th I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansen, again, for joining us in the middle of the night. It means so much, and we're so lucky to have these three wonderful speakers here tonight.